everybody. Go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Sue E. I'm the long-term care nurse educator. Uh, let me introduce some of our program planners. Uh, Sandra Young, you probably met her at registration. She's one of our nurse educators at Audiel Murphy. Um, another program planner is Pat Walters. She was there in the back. Pat, yeah. Uh, she's our nurse educator here at Audi and at Kerrville. Uh, another sponsor that we have is Greg Thompson. He's there in the back. He has his wound care products from Medline, and they're the sponsor of this program. And if you haven't already, uh, make sure that you put your nursing license number in order to get your certificate at the end of the class. He has a table in the back, and he has some goodies there, so make sure you stop by and see him and check it out. Uh, Jill Dickerson is our new wound care nurse, and she has several products that we have here at the VA that you can check out there in the back, too. Uh, Mark Johnson, he's from Geriatric Education Center. He's here in the front. He's our AV specialist, and um, he's going to be taking this. Do his piece of adhesive. So I don't normally recommend duoderm or, or transparent dressings because they're very adhesive. Uh, I'm a diplomat of the American Professional Wound Care Association. I'm also a fellow of the American College of Certified Wound Specialists, but I didn't have enough room left. <laughs> certified foot care nurse, certified wound osteocontinence nurse, certified wound specialist. Those are different organizations. All right, let's go. Everybody following along in the syllabus okay? You're checking off your objectives. Let's see, we've done objective number one, two, three, four, five. We just did the objective six, three criteria of wound uh, assessment. We did number seven. So we got four left here in these next two sessions, okay? And Greg told me uh, that at the, end of, at the end of the program, make sure you turn in your evaluation form back there and the certificates will be out on the table back there in alphabetical order. But he did say there was some people that may not have a certificate because he couldn't read your name, he couldn't read your writing. Go figure. Um, and did everybody get their license number done, Greg? Sue? Yeah, we do need your home address on there, and it's not because we do telemarketing or anything. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come knock at your door just to, you know, say hi. Um, we we need that in case you get audited by the boards, and they call to verify that you did attend this. They need to be able to match up your license number with your home address to prove it's you. It was actually you that came. That's the only reason. Those those addresses go in a file in Chicago at headquarters and. Nobody else sees them. They're locked away from the light of day, okay? So don't be scared to put that down. On the next break, make sure you get your nursing license number and all the rest of that filled out, checked, and, um, and make sure you've got a certificate back there. You can't take it until you turn in your eval, okay? Let's see. If necrotic tissue is present in a pressure ulcer, the ulcer will be at least a stage three. Exactly right. Slough is necrotic tissue inside the wound. It could be yellow, tan, gray, green, or brown. True. It can be all different colors, depending on which cocktail you ordered. Granulation tissue is visible in a partial thickness or stage two wound. False. No granulation tissue in partial thickness wound healing. The specific dressing applied to the wound is the only factor that affects wound healing. Oh. Oh. All chronic wounds are contaminated but not necessarily infected. I think I already said that. We're going to talk about that in this, in this session right here though. We're going to talk about cleaning our wounds, debriding our wounds, managing the bacterial load in our wounds. Keeping in mind that in order for our wounds to heal normally, we've got to keep the bacteria load down. Now somebody asked me a break. Well, what do we do if we have this tissue that's not granulating? You know, if it's like that, just that pink, clean, non-granular tissue. Well, one of the reasons that could be happening is because we have too much bacteria. You know, wounds can't heal if there's bacteria there. It can also be because of biofilm formation, and we're going to talk about that as well. 
So in order to keep them on track, we've got to keep a close eye on them. We've got to keep that bacteria level down. It's helpful if they have a good immune system and good blood flow, and we have their diabetes under control and any other underlying disease processes. And then we have to know what we're expecting to see happening. We have to have an understanding of when should we expect to see healing occurring. Because without that understanding, how do you know if what you're doing is working? If you don't know what you're looking for. Okay? So here's your basics of wound care. We talked about doing a comprehensive assessment. The next thing you need to do after you do your assessment is do a good thorough cleansing. Get rid of any necrotic tissue that may be in the wound. And then we utilize our dressings in the next session to help us maintain an optimally moist wound bed. Okay? The goal with cleansing is to remove all the bacteria and surface debris, everything we can, out of this wound without damaging the underlying tissue. Okay? Studies have shown us that, it, that normal saline is a good wound cleanser if you have a clean, healthy, granulating wound. It's a great wound cleanser. However, if you have a wound that's heavily infected or colonized with bacteria, or you have a lot of necrotic tissue and debris in this wound, you may want to take advantage of one of the commercial cleansers. Why? Because they contain surfactants. Now, what did we say about surfactants when it came to cleaning skin? We didn't like them, right? Because they strip everything out. When it comes to cleaning wounds, we want that surfactant action. We want to strip all that bad stuff off of the tissue. And you can even get wound cleansers that are antimicrobial that will kill bacteria and strip all that necrotic tissue and debris out of the wound to help you get a good thorough wound cleansing. Studies have shown us that in order to get a good wound cleansing, you have to administer the irrigant at the right amount of pressure. You have to use the right amount of force. And I'm really a firm believer in it doesn't really matter so much what you're using to clean your wounds with as long as you're using the right amount of pressure. There's lots of studies out there that will tell you that tap water is just as effective a cleanser as anything else you can use. Especially on lower extremity ulcers. Most of the studies have been on venous ulcers and things like that. And I really think that, you know, you can clean a wound with pretty much anything you want. If you're using the right amount of pressure, that's what's helping to dislodge the bacteria that are stuck to this wound bed and the debris and the necrotic tissue. That's really the most important aspect of a wound cleansing. And we oftentimes short sell ourselves on this, and it's just my personal opinion that I think we, we actually promote a lot of the biofilm, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, that grows on our wound beds because we forget about using appropriate pressure. And we let that bacteria sit there on the wound bed, and instead we come in there with these little bullets, you know, these little pink saline bullets, you know, they have like three cc's of saline. They fit real nice in your scrub pockets, your lab coat pockets, and we go in there and we go drip, 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 and we take our... our four by four and we just kind of gently scrub at it a little bit and we think we cleaned that wound. Well, you know what? You know how clean you got that wound? Mm -hmm. About as clean as you would get if you were under a faucet taking a shower and it was going drip, drip, drip. How clean would you get? You wouldn't. You want, you got to have a shower that blows with some force there. You just get this dirt off of you. Wound cleansing is the same way. I had a nurse in, in my class yesterday and she said, well, you know what? We're not allowed to take our wound cleanser into the patient's room. And I said, well, how are you cleaning the wounds? From the doorway? <laughs> she said, no, we don't, we don't give each person their own individual cleaner. We spray it on a 4x4 out on the treatment card and then take it in the room. Well, what's that doing? Drip, drip, drip. Yeah. Okay, so you just have to think about what we're doing, okay? Pulse lavage, whirlpool are other acceptable methods of cleansing. Therapists typically use these modalities. You guys, you, any of you guys do pulse lavage anymore? Anybody do whirlpool anymore? No. Some, you do some. 
I find it kind of regionalized in, in different areas of the country I go to. Some areas I still find pockets where therapists are still doing pulse of eyes and whirlpool and other areas where they say, no, we don't do that here anymore. So I think that kind of depends on the therapist and on the doc and how comfortable you are with it. And, um, but very good methods of cleansing. Very appropriate. Here's our argument we had earlier and we talked about. You know, are these things good or bad for wound healing? Well, you know, the HCPR guidelines addressed this in the early 90s in regards to pressure ulcers. And what they said was, if we know these products are cytotoxic to fibroblasts, they kill healthy growing tissue. So if you decide you do need to use one of these antiseptic cleansers, there's a couple of things you need to do. First off, you need to use it in the lowest concentration possible to accomplish your goal. Okay? Dilute it down as much as you can so it's as it's so that it's causing as little harm as possible. And then you need to use it for as short a period of time as you can to accomplish your goal. Use it for just what you're needing it to, and then once you reach that point, move on to more appropriate therapy. Okay? So there's a, there's a new study, a new case series in the Journal of Wound Ostomy Continence Nursing this month that I've been reading, and it's on use of Dakin's. And they're saying, you know, Dakin's solution can be very effective. And they're showing all these case studies where they've used Dakin's solution. Well, here's what they did. They had patients with wounds, and the wounds had gotten to a point where they weren't go healing anymore. They were looking really bad. It was, it was uh, uh, theorized or assessment findings kind of led them to believe that we've got a bacterial bio burden on here that we need to get rid of. So they switched them over to quarter strength Dakins, sometimes eight strength, uh, strength Dakins. And they used it for a couple of weeks to kill all the bacteria. Wound healing started again. They stopped it and went to more appropriate therapy. Went back onto the vac or went back onto you know, alginates or gels or whatever they were using. Now that's very appropriate use of an antiseptic for a specific purpose. And if you're using these products like that, that's acceptable as long as you're documenting why you're using it and you can justify it. Now, I've known docs that would take patients with infected pressure ulcers into the OR, do this big, huge debridement. They come back, they come to the floor, and for the next three to five days, they're in quarter strength Dakins. We're packing it twice a day. Y'all didn't even stop me when I said that four letter word. We're filling that with four. With Dakin strength with uh, quarter strength Dakin's gauze twice a day with the goal in mind to continue eradicating all remaining surface bacteria to set up a wound bed that's ready, that's clean and ready to heal. Now that may be appropriate use because we've established our goal and we're using it for a short limited period of time. What's not appropriate like I had somebody come to one of my classes a few months ago and we were talking about this and she said, well, well how long is too long on something like Dakin's? And I said, well, tell me what you're doing. And she said, well, we got a patient home from the hospital uh, a while back in home care and, and they came home with orders for Dakin's solution twice a day. And I said, well, how long has that been? A month? And I said, was well, the wound healing? Well, no, that's why I was wondering how long is too long. And I said, well, you should never wait a month to, to decide, oh, this isn't healing, this isn't working. You should, have, you should have maybe gone a week or two weeks at the most and realized this isn't going the right way. I need to do something else and called and got some more orders. Because continued use of that is definitely not considered standard of care. It is not reasonable, necessary, and appropriate. And that's ultimately what we've got to decide, okay? I, I will recommend betadine, hodon iodine, on heal scar to help keep it clean, dry, and free of infection. Betadine is an astringent. It dries things out. It kills every critter that's growing on that piece of dead tissue there. So it accomplishes our goals. Our goals are to keep it clean, dry, and free of infection. That's very appropriate to accomplish our goals. Now, I would not want to put it on the surrounding skin because then I'm going to dry that skin out and compromise that skin and we're going to damage it, so that would not be appropriate. So you see how you use these products? 
Okay? Anybody got a, got a dog? You ever tried to clean out the water bowl? And you stick it under the sink and you turn the water on and it just slides right off of this film of slime that covers that bowl. And you can't rinse it out. And what do you got to do? You got to scrub it out of there, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I'd use some bleach too. Anybody got kids that won't brush their teeth? And you have to take them to the dentist and they got biofilm all over and how does he get it off? Scrapes it off of there. Well, you know, we've known about biofilm in the environment for years and years and years. It took us a while to come around to the understanding that if it's growing in the water bowl, it's probably growing in the wounds. And you know, one of the most common places for biofilm formation is in catheters. Biofilm, is we, there's lots of research done on this. Biofilm formation on the, on the inside lumen of that catheter that's, that's the main reason they tell you if you have to do uh, a collect a urine sample, don't ever take a urine sample from an indwelling Foley catheter that's been sitting there for any period of time. Because when you suck that urine out, guess what you're sucking out with it? All the bacteria that's growing inside of that catheter. The only way to get a true urine specimen, if you're going to do a CNS on it, is to take that old one out, put a new one in, and collect your urine from a clean catheter. That's CDC guidelines. That's WCM guidelines. That's every national guideline that's out there is going to tell you that. That's not new practice. That is best practice. Okay? So what happens here is bacteria have learned over millennia how to protect themselves in the world. And so they, we know that when they're out there in that free-floating state, they're kind of out there on their own, pretty easy to kill them. So what they've learned to do is they, they go down and attach themselves to a surface, and they secrete this poly, uh, polysaccharide coating over themselves. They wall themselves off. They make their own little biodome. And I saw that old Paula Shore movie a couple weeks ago, and it made me think of this. Because these bacteria are just like them. They secrete this enzyme and make their own little biodome. And then they're in there partying like rock stars. And other bacteria floating around in the wound bed, I guess, see the party going on. They come down and join. And they start secreting their, their own coating. And then before it's all over, we had this multi-organism system growing on the base of this wound that is completely impervious to everything. You can't kill it with systemic antibiotics. You can't kill it with topical antibiotics. You can't touch it. The body doesn't even recognize it's there, yet these bacteria are just in there having a good old time, secreting all these damaging toxic enzymes into the tissue, and wound healing stops. So the only way to get rid of a biofilm is how? To breed it, it's got to be... Scraped out of there, right? Just like any other kind. So if you think you've got too much bacteria in your wound, your wound's not, not healing very well, um, the healing is stopping, your granulation tissue is going away, start cleaning more frequently and more aggressively. Make sure you're using the right amount of pressure. Okay? You may, you may want to consider a commercial wound cleanser. You want to keep a real close eye on it. Here's our options for debridement. And what are we debriding? Just what we talked about. That dead beef jerky-like tissue and those cocktails. Okay? Why do we want to get rid of it? Because the presence of necrotic tissue increases your risk for infection, keeps your wounds in that inflammatory phase of wound healing, and we can't heal. You can't grow new tissue over dead tissue. Okay? Now here's a question, here's a, I said, not necessarily a question, uh oh, maybe my battery's, maybe the wire. Okay, I get, I get calls on the hotline like this fairly regularly, and a nurse will call and she'll say, I've got this patient with this wound and I need your help. And I'll say, okay, tell me about the wound. And she'll say, well, okay, so he's got this wound and it's got this like a scab or an escar or, or something, you know what I mean? And I'll say, no. <laughs> And they'll say, well, it's like a scab or an escar covering it. You, you know. And I'll say, no. What do you mean? Well, it's a scab or an escar. And I'll say, 
Well, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to tell me which one. Because they're not anywhere similar. Is, is dried blood and exudate the same as dried, desiccated, mummified tissue? <laughs> Do I need to know which it is before I tell you how to proceed? Yeah. So you've got to take a good look at what you've got to work with there. You can't make a determination of what your next step is until you know what you're dealing with. And they're not anywhere similar. And I hear that all the time. It's either a scab or a scar. It's a scab or a scar. It's a scab or a scar. Well, look at it. Tell me what it is. Expect healing to occur after you debride. And we've got a lot of different options to help us debride wounds. The gold standard, of course, is shark debridement. Take them to the OR and cut it all out. The quickest way to convert a chronic wound back to an acute wound. And it really, it really works, or we at least hope it works most of the time. And it's really simple. You go, you take a patient to the OR and you cut all the dead stuff out. You go all the way back to good tissue until it bleeds, just like an initial injury. You bleed, you clot, and it kicks off the entire healing cascade. Boom, jump starts healing, just like that. At least that's, that's a theory. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay? Not everybody's a surgical candidate. Not everybody needs that. So we have other options. Shark conservative shark debridement. It's an option I've been doing for over 10 years. It's a very quick, effective way to just remove necrotic tissue. I don't go back until they bleed. I just get rid of the dead stuff. Okay? It can be done anywhere. I've done it in the home for years. Okay? Pretty cheap. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to have an OR to do this using scalpel, scissors, forceps, things like that. Here's, here's a, a pressure ulcer. And again, this is a nice round pressure ulcer. It's one I debrided a few years ago. It took me about 15 minutes. And now we're down to adipose tissue. That's fat tissue there. Um, very quick way to clean it up, get rid of the tissue that's harboring the bacteria, and then move on towards wound healing. Okay? Mechanical debridement. This is the only use of wet to dry dressings that is considered appropriate, I guess. I don't know that that's even a good word. It's accepted. This is an accepted use of wet to dry dressings. Okay? This is what they do. They mechanically debrid wounds. And going back to the HCPR guidelines, that was the only approved use of wet to dry dressing is if you were trying to debrid a wound. And it says in those guidelines published by the government, a wet to dry dressing is not considered a moisture retentive dressing. It is not moist wound healing. It is only for mechanical debridement. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you would not choose this form of debridement. First off, it's painful. It's non-selective. It takes good tissue, bad tissue. It doesn't care. It's traumatic to the, to the tissue. Very time consuming. And... If you're going to do it, you better do it like it says. Put it in wet, take it out dry. And I really think that one reason that we have such a problem with this practice and why it continues and so many people think it works is because doctors don't realize that we've been lying to them all these years. They're writing orders for wet to dry dressings and we hadn't been doing it. Because what do we do? We put it in wet, and then what do we do before we take it out? We moisten it, don't we? Because we know it hurts. That's not a wet-to-dry dressing. You cancel out all the benefits of a wet-to-dry dressing, which is mechanical debridement. That's what it's used for when you moisten it. And so everybody thinks it works beautifully, because we've never once followed the order. Am I lying? No. Because I'm not going to go in there and rip this dry dressing out that's stuck to somebody's tissue and, and wait and see how loud they can scream. Are you? Because that hurts. It hurts me to look at it. This is archaic 20th century wound care. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Why did we use wet to dry dressings for debridement and wound management back in the day? That's all we had. Just like egg crate mattresses, just like donuts, just like all those other antiquated things that we used to do 
putting sugar in pressure ulcers, Maalox in our wounds, and heat lamps, and all that other crazy stuff we used to do. It's because that was all we had, and we didn't know any better. But we know better now, so why are we still doing it? And if you think that a gauze dressing is doing anything to, first off, keep a wound bed optimally moist, it's not. Second off, keep it insulated, it's not. Keep it protected, it's not. It's not keeping it from getting contaminated or infected, unless I guess you're putting over 65 layers of gauze on it, because studies show bacteria can migrate through 64 layers of gauze. So how are you preventing contamination in your patients? I guess you're taking that whole tube of gauze and sticking it on their hip when you dress their wound. And you say, well, that bacteria is not getting through my dressing. <laughs> That's the only way you could say that. Ultrasonic debridement is another form of debridement. Pretty cool machine if you if you've ever seen one. I got to see one in a wound clinic in Atlanta one time. It's just it's just amazing how it just melts necrotic tissue off. Doesn't hurt the granulation tissue at all. The healthy tissue, pretty cool. Enzymatic debriders have been a hot button subject for the past couple of years now because the FDA pulled the approval for all of our papain urea debriders. That's your Panafil and Accuzyme and all those generic equivalents of that. They're no longer on the market. They're gone for good. They're not coming back. Sorry. They're gone. All we have now is collagenase, right? Santal. Collagenase Santal. And that's the only enzymatic debrider we have. It's the only one that, honestly, when the FDA went back and did drug reviews on these products, this was the only one that showed, had enough studies to prove that it was safe and effective for, effective for use in human subjects. On the contrary, all of your papain-urea based debriders, over the years that they had been on the market, had a, a list as long as your arm at the FDA of reported adverse events and even patient deaths associated with uses of, of those products. So, when they were asked to prove that they were safe and effective, they didn't have enough studies to show that. On the contrary, they had a lot of things working against them. So, they pulled their approval. No longer on the market. Polyacrylate debriders is a, is a very viable option when it comes to selecting a choice of debridement method, you know. And a lot of people are looking for options now because, like it or not, some people like collagenase, some people don't. Um, some people just think it doesn't work fast enough and we're looking for other alternatives. This is a, a very viable alternative. And this is essentially supercharged, super fast, autolytic debridement on steroids. It's like a muscle car for autolytic debridement. Okay? And it, it uses these poly, uh, polyacrylate gel beads, these polymer beads, that have a real high attraction for large protein molecules. So when you put them over a, a necrotic wound with, that's got a lot of bacteria and necrotic tissue, it literally just sucks those large protein molecules up out of the wound. Now, we saturate this dressing with ringer solution, not lactated ringers, just ringer solution. And so in order for that dressing to absorb a molecule of protein, it has to release a molecule of ringers. So we get a continual rinsing and flushing of the wound, a cleansing of the wound, a transfer, you know, I'll trade you a molecule of this for a molecule of that, and very fast, very quick, very safe, autolytic debridement. And we'll see this case study in the next session as well. 19 days from that to that. Pain-free, non-adherent, no contraindications. You don't have to worry. Oh, you don't have to. Uh-oh, did I lose it? You don't have to worry about um, adverse reactions. You don't have to worry about allergic reactions. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Some studies have shown that the use of this product, it, it, it helps bind MMPs, those bad enzymes that we, see, we find in chronic wound fluid. So it can help with that as well. Um, it can, has also been shown to assist with the breakup and preventing reformation of biofilm. Another good benefit. It's just a pretty versatile dressing. 
Now, autolytic debridement is the body's own natural way of liquefying and breaking down dead tissue. Okay? It's the way it's designed to do. Depends on white blood cells, so you kind of need to have a functioning immune system. If you don't have a white count, you're probably not going to get autolytic debridement. And sometimes, if we're managing a wound and all we have is a little bit of necrotic tissue in the wound, you know, we may not need to focus on debridement. We may say, well, I'm just going to put a dressing in here that's going to manage my exudate, give me a moist wound bed, and I'm going to let it autolytically debrid. Just clean itself up. I don't have, it's not that big of a problem. It, it's very easy to do. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to create a moist wound environment. So it's low cost, very selective. It's a great way to do it. This is... This is a form of debridement that I think we're going to see a lot of in the future. And it only makes sense. If you want to clean up dead, nasty, yucky, necrotic tissue, why would you not go out and hire highly trained, skilled professionals that have been doing it for millennia? They like what they're doing, and they do a good job. And they're very cheap. They work for very cheap. They're not very expensive at all. And, you know, you can put them in a wound. They're not interested in harming the good stuff. Uh, by the way, they, they secrete enzymes that actually are anti-infective, anti-inflammatory. They decrease inflammation. They, they suck up bacteria that causes infection. They only eat the bad stuff, so it's not like you're going to dump them in somebody's wound and they're going to go running up their leg looking for something else to chew on. They're going to stay right where you put them. They're going to eat until they get full and then they're just going to fall off and lay there fat and happy. Absolutely. And you know what? You're not going to leave them there until they grow up and fly away. You're going to get them, you're going to put them in there, and you're going to say, go have a party. I'll see you in a couple of days. You come back, and they're just the happiest clams because they've been munching away. You wash them out. You don't go throw them in the trash can. You, know, you have to dispose of them like biological waste. And they do a really good job. And if you, you know, especially if you're using it on patients with diabetic foot ulcers and stuff that have really bad neuropathy, they don't even get that creepy crawly feeling. I'm just kidding. Golly. Y'all are gullible. They probably don't, but, you know, sometimes we don't want to debride tissue. We talked about the, per the reasons why we don't want to debride on the heels. Anything on the distal third of the foot, you better not debride it until you know how much blood flow you have. Okay? Just rule of thumb. Check blood flow. Sometimes... Wounds, depending on their location or their etiology, can be what I call my dirty wounds. Any lower extremity wound, I just, I just know it's going to be highly contaminated. I read a study once on venous ulcers. They, they uh, swabbed, swab cultured like over 400 venous ulcers, and the average number of organisms per, per ulcer was like 4.4. One ulcer cultured over 26 different organisms growing in it. They're nasty. You don't have to do a swab culture of a venous ulcer to know there's bacteria there. You don't have to do a swab culture of a neuropathic ulcer, or what we call a diabetic foot ulcer, to know that there's bacteria there. Look at the location. You know, you know there's going to be bacteria there. What you may not, even if you do a swab culture, you're probably only going to identify the aerobic organisms. You're not going to identify the, a I mean, you're going to identify the anaerobes. You're not going to... Did I say that right? Now I got myself confused. You're going to identify the aerobes, not the anaerobes. Okay? You're not going to see those... those you're not going to identify those organisms that are lurking under the surface there in that low oxygen environment there that are just eating away at, at tissue. So, we know that all wounds are contaminated. That's not a problem. Our body consists of normal flora, keeps us functioning, you know, keeps our gut functioning fine. We have normal flora on our skin, not a problem. Normal flora in the wound kind of keeps things going in, a, in an orderly fashion. 
It's only when those bacteria get out of control that we start seeing problems with wound healing. So, are these wounds contaminated? Every wound's contaminated, okay? Only when these bacteria start replicating and they start to overwhelm the host do we start seeing wounds that won't heal, wounds that go bad. See a lot of these, I see a lot of these in flaps because we're flapping over pressure ulcers that were infected and the wound bed's not real clean and we just take a big piece of muscle and turn it around and lay it down over that and bacteria just eats all that muscle up. Wound infection. Now, now these bacteria are really starting to replicate and now we're really going to start seeing some of our signs and symptoms of a localized wound infection that we talked about earlier. Okay? Things like this. You're going to see your drainage change. Maybe it's just clear, serous, yellow fluid, and all of a sudden it starts turning milky looking, yucky, greenish looking. Pretty good indicator that you might have a problem. Your, your wound's just not healing. You may have too much bacteria on there. Your granulation tissue, instead of being really nice and healthy and beefy and, and bumpy and looking really nice and growing really good, it may just start kind of disappearing on you or just kind of just not looking real healthy anymore. And you start developing these pockets at the base of the wound where bacteria are just eating away at the underlying tissue. And you get these, it looks like sometimes like little divots in the bottom of the wound. I see that a lot in pressure ulcers. That's from too much bacteria. So this is where I say it's really important for you to develop a relationship with your wounds. Okay, because, you know, when I wake up in the morning, do I have to ask my wife if something's wrong to know that there's a problem and I probably better keep my mouth shut today? I can just see it on her face, you know. And your wounds are the same. You don't have to wait until its head starts spinning around and it's spewing green drainage out to know that there's a problem. If, you're, if you've built a good relationship with it, you look at it one day and you take that dressing off and you go, oh, what's wrong, baby? You know, what, what's wrong? Are you mad at something about something? You can just see things don't look right. And you can notice these subtle signs. The granulation is the first thing you're going to start seeing. The granulation is not going to look healthy. Your drainage may increase. You know, if you have a heavily exudating wound, that's an indication you've got too much bacteria in the wound because that's a normal reaction by the body to flush out bacteria, to flush out stuff that's in the wound. That's a normal response. Start draining and flush it all out. So if you have a wound that's draining a lot, chances are you probably need to kill bacteria. And once you do, your drainage is going to go down. So if your drainage starts increasing, that's a pretty good sign. And if you're keeping a close eye on it and you're developing a relationship with it, you're going to see these signs real quick and hopefully you'll be able to intervene more quickly so that you don't go down that road uh, towards wound, wounds that go bad on us. Okay? Make a note of the edge of the skin. Okay? Like we talked about, the difference between a normal inflammatory response and infection. It's important to catch that early before it turns into advancing cellulitis and maybe even sepsis. Once we get septic, you know, these are our classic signs, then we've really got a problem. And we may not always be able to rely on systemic antibiotics to help us with this. Because if we have perfusion problems, especially on lower extremity ulcers, you may not be able to count on enough antibiotic getting to that tissue. It has to be delivered through the blood, and if you don't have much blood going there, it may not be getting there in an adequate amount to, uh, to manage anything. You may not, if you've got a biofilm, does it matter how, many, how much systemic antibiotics you throw in there? No. Does it matter how much Bacterban you slather on top of this thing? And that seems to be the cure for everything, doesn't it? Just Bacterban. We'll just put some Bacterban on it. You know, I don't know what to do with it, but order some Bacterban. And we just 
throw antibiotics all over the place and don't really know why or what we're trying to get. And then we wind up in the situation we are today where we've got all these drug resistant organisms and we can't get, we don't have, any, we're getting less and less able to kill organisms because we've just thrown antibiotics all over the place when instead we probably should have been looking at our antimicrobials that are available out there that we've been using for years that don't have a problem with organisms becoming resistant, that we don't have a problem with allergic reactions to. You know, TAO or Neosporin is another one of my pet peeves because we throw TAO on everything. And how often do we ask our patients, are you allergic to neomycin? That's one of the most potent sensitizers, allergens out there. It's an antibiotic, and we don't even ask. We just slather it on there. We don't know what it's, we're trying to kill. We don't know how long it works, but we're going to change it ever so often anyway. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's that funny. <laughs> and get, get me on my soapbox. I know, I'm sorry. You know, I, I get those orders too, and, and I just want to beat my head against a wall. You know, and sometimes I'd be better off just doing that, just knock myself senseless and go do it, instead of arguing. But it doesn't make any sense. And the only people that are going to be able to change the way we do things is us. We have to create that culture of change so that we can do things right. We don't have to keep doing things the wrong way. We can change. Okay? Antimicrobials work wonderfully. They're more broad spectrum than most of our antibiotics. They don't have uh, allergic reactions. We don't have sensitivity issues. They're safe. Why aren't we using them? They're available. Come on. Now, when it comes to identifying infection, the CDC says the only way that you can accurately diagnose infection is through a biopsy, whether it's a punch biopsy, a needle aspiration biopsy. How often do we do that? No, we do swab cultures, right? And here's what I see. We, we get an order, we say, oh, we're going to go swab, we're going to go culture this wound. And we go in there and we stick that, that Q-tip thing in there and we swab the pus and we swab, swab on that nasty stuff, that slough and the escar. And I look at people and I go, why are you wasting money on lab work? I can tell you there's bacteria growing there. Is that what we care about? Not supposed to be. Because we know everyone's contaminated. We know there's bacteria growing in that pus and in that slough and in that, on that escar, on all that dead tissue. It's nasty. Of course there's critters growing there. We don't care about that. I want to know what's growing in that tissue that's causing this big red infl inflammation and induration in the tissue surrounding this wound. The only way I'm going to find that out is if I first do a good thorough flushing and get rid of as much of that surface bacteria as I can, find me a one square centimeter area of clean viable tissue, and sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes that wound's going to have to be debrided before I can find any viable tissue. Sometimes I'm going to have to take an applicator and kind of push stuff out of the way so I can find some clean tissue down there. And then I'm going to have to swab it hard enough to express some of the exudate. When I'm teaching nurses to do this, I say, swab it hard enough to get some of the juice out. That's what you want. You want to push some of that juice out of the bottom of that tissue because that's what you, you want to know what bacteria is growing down there. In, under, the, under the surface, in that tissue that's causing this inflammation, this redness, this, this edema, this induration in the surrounding tissue. That's what you want to know. And let me tell you, if you've already started antibiotics before you did this, probably not going to get accurate results. And if you go ahead and start antibiotics while you're waiting on the culture to come back, that's definitely not good practice. That's just throwing antibiotics out the door, and that's what gets us to this resistance problem. Wait the couple of days it takes to make sure you use the right antibiotic so that you target the species. 
Well, I'll put somebody on an antibiotic for three days that's not even targeting the right thing, only to three days later come back and say, oh, we were wrong. Throw that one away and start a new one. That's where we get problems. And your current, you know, the, the most recent uh, research article I read here in a, a few months ago now recommends you use sterile technique when you're doing a swab culture. So think about that as well when you're doing your swabs. Okay? Good thorough assessment. Good cleansing. Good debridement. Now we're going to talk about in the next session how do we keep an optimally moist wound bed. Okay? Any questions? So we can we can with assurance tell the doctor that this is evidence based practice, right? You can tell the doctor anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna promise you it'll work. Just like you know, you can tell me anything you want, and I'm not gonna assure you that I'll agree with you either. But we have to start somewhere, don't we? We have to try. We have to get the word out. And if it doesn't start with us, who's it going to start with? If we wait for other people to decide that they're screwing up, we're going to be old and out of practice before things change. Okay? All right, y'all take a break. Anybody ever feel like that? <laughs>